Hello, this is different, isn't it? <laughs> I've got a really chaotic month ahead of me and I just needed some really gentle videos to make while I focus on this big project I've got going on outside of YouTube. And as you know, I've had a little bit of a difficult year or six months maybe in terms of my health and my ability to sew. So I have been trying lots of different things and I am working on a series of me trying lots of different crafts. But one of the ones that I've been really enjoying at the minute, let me move the tea out of the way, is painting my numbers for adults. <laughs> I always loved these as a kid and my sister-in-law had done one and I thought it was so gorgeous, the finished result. And I asked for one as my Christmas present this year because I knew I wanted to try different crafts. And this is how far I've gotten in four months. <laughs> but I thought this would be the perfect little craft project to do while I do a little Q&A because I've never done a Q&A before and I have gone through a period of quite rapid growth this year. So there are a lot of new people here and I keep getting a lot of questions about things that obviously my long-term viewers might know, but my newer viewers might not. So here we are. I'm going to answer your questions as I do my paint by numbers. First things first. So this kit is from a company called Figure Dart. Like I say, that's not Dart as in the game, that's Dart as in D apostrophe art. C'est Francais. And I can't remember the name of this painting, but it's Georges Seurat. And it's very, it's the very famous example of uh, pointillism. It's called something like Sunday Afternoon by the Island or something like that. According to Wikipedia, it's a Sunday afternoon on the island of La Grande Jette. Jette doesn't tell me how to pronounce it. Oh well. And I didn't choose this one. My brother and sister-in-law chose it, but it's I love Impressionist art. I had a wonderful time in Paris as a 20-something. I went for on a little solo trip to Paris, which, which is incredible really to think that I did once, uh, given how ill I now am. But I love Impressionist art and it's such a good choice for a paint by numbers, I think, because it's done in the pointillism style, so it's already pretty abstract. And I've just been loving it. I love it. It's so relaxing and I get so in the zone with it. So I might zone out and forget to answer all the questions. <laughs> so I got some pretty standard questions because I realised, like I say, there's quite a few new people here and so they don't know a lot about me generally as a person. So I thought I'd just do a very quick brief introduction. Somebody asked me if Claude is my real name. Yes, Claude is my real name. It's short for Claudia. I'm 30, which somebody else asked how old I am. They seemed to be surprised. They thought I was younger than I might be. I don't know, I'm very flattered, but I'm curious to know how old you thought I was. But yes, I am 30 and I live in the south of England with my mum and dad. And I know that living at home with your mum and dad at 30 is not, it's not common maybe. And I don't think it's anybody's aspiration. Uh, but the reason I live at home with my mum and dad is because I live with a disability called myalgic encephalomyelitis. That's why we call it ME for short. It's also known as chronic fatigue syndrome, but I personally don't like to use that title because my experience of ME is so much more than fatigue. And I know a lot of people in the ME community feel the same way as well. Of all the symptoms I experience, the fatigue is probably the most manageable. So I don't feel like it accurately represents my experience. I hope you'll indulge me and let me talk a little bit about ME because there is so much misinformation still about ME out there. But ME is classed by the World Health Organization as a neurological condition. But there is so little research into ME, like a shockingly, shockingly little amount, that we don't really know what causes it. We don't really even know what's happening in the body. The current sort of working hypothesis, and there is growing evidence to support this, is that it's an issue with the mitochondria. And as we all know, the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. So essentially in ME, the issue is that the demand for energy that your mitochondria is putting on the body is outstripped by the, ability, the amount of energy your body is able to supply. If that happens, you die. So thankfully, the body has several backup methods to stop you dying. Uh, but they're not meant for long-term use. So it has a backup method of energy production, but it requires seven times the amount of energy to use the backup method than it does the original method. So what happens there is the body is inadvertently making the demand 
issue seven times worse and the supply will never catch up. And the body can also do things to decrease, to try and decrease demand. So it kind of shuts down systems that are not as urgent. But for whatever reason in ME, there is either an is issue that we don't know about upstream with this energy supply, or the emergency modes get switched on by a virus and or some other trigger that we don't know what could be. And then for whatever reason, the body cannot switch out of emergency mode. Because the issue is if you keep going into emergency mode, what happens is eventually you crash. The body cannot keep running on increased demand, limited supply, and shutting down some of its major functions before it makes you deliberately very, very ill to force you to, to decrease demand. There's also lots of knock-on effects. So like if the digestive system is constantly being shut down, which is one of the first ones the body shuts down, you're prone to malnutrition, you can't absorb nutrients, you become deficient in minerals and vitamins, and it's sort of a downward spiral. So there are different severities of ME. At the mild end, people with ME can live an almost ordinary life and they have to manage symptoms, but they can participate in work and family life and things. And I have had moments in my time with ME where I was almost entirely symptom free and I worked full time and I went to university and that's when, when you hear me talk about my professional work, that's where I was. Uh, I am now more in the moderate category. So people in the moderate category are typically housebound, need mobility aids, and cannot do a lot of basic care for themselves. The severe category, people tend to be completely bed bound. So they need help to do personal care like washing, getting to the bathroom, uh, brushing their teeth, getting dressed, that sort of thing. I have been in that category and I was in that category when I got COVID. Um, and I'd never experienced ME at that severity before. And I'm very grateful that I have managed to recover to a point that I am now back in the moderate category, because for some people, they never recover. They will be bed bound for life. And then there are people in the very severe category who are not just entirely bed bound, but they're often tube fed, they often need a catheter, because they cannot move physically at all. They often cannot tolerate light or noise at all. So they spend their entire life lying in the dark. In, its severe, in, in the severest cases, ME can be fatal. I don't think a lot of people realize that, particularly when you hear this narrative of like, oh, chronic fatigue syndrome, you're just tired all the time, or like you're lazy, work should I lay about? But ME kills people. And part of the reason it kills people is because of the neg medical negligence and abuse that ME patients experience. Going into hospital as an ME patient, as an, I, personally I can't talk about it because I have been an ME patient in hospital in a very scary situation. What I will do is I will leave some links in the description to ME charities who are currently advocating for ME patients who are being mistreated in hospital. It's a difficult read, and I appreciate a lot of you who watch my videos have your own health issues, but I urge you please not to look away because ME shouldn't be fatal. It shouldn't. You, should, you shouldn't die of malnutrition in hospital because the doctors are too ignorant about what you actually need, because the doctors are so prejudiced and ignorant about your condition that they refuse to treat you for malnutrition because that is the situation a lot of ME patients find themselves in. And that's an incredibly scary position to be in because if your condition gets worse, there is no help from doctors. And that is why we practice pacing. So pacing is, tr is the only way to manage ME. It can help to improve your symptoms, but generally what you're doing is trying to stop yourself getting worse. So you're trying to stop yourself pushing yourself into emergency mode, because then what happens when you get into emergency mode is you end up damaging your body, but then you don't have the cells to repair and it's a vicious cycle downwards. So it's that vicious cycle downwards that I am trying to avoid and ME patients, and I suppose long COVID patients, but it's ME at this point. If you've still got long COVID, welcome to the ME community. But that is the only thing we can do to try and manage our health. So yes, that's why I live with my mum and dad. <laughs> So I appreciate that was quite a dark note to start on, but I do get a lot of questions about ME and I never know how much to say because 
So somebody asked me, is it okay to ask your disability or is that considered rude? And my answer is basically yes and yes, because yes, it is considered rude. You should not ask strangers in person or online their confidential medical history. You shouldn't ask anybody whether they're visibly disabled or not, their confidential medical history. That kind of goes without saying. And disabled people are often subjected to a lot of invasive personal medical questions throughout their life. So if a stranger is asking you invasive personal or medical questions, it is kind of a bit like, here we go again. But in this context, I don't mind questions about my disability because I'm doing a Q&A video. I am very open about it and its impact on my ability to work. And I mention it frequently here. So obviously you're going to have questions, but generally don't ask disabled people about their disability. If you need to ask somebody their access needs, you can say, please, could you let me know your access needs? Is there anything you'll require in terms of access? You know, if you're like in a customer service position or something, but just asking people, oh, what's your disability randomly? No. Somebody also asked me about treatments I, I follow for Emmy. I'm sorry, I'm not willing to answer that. And that is because <sighs> if you get into dodgy legal territory when it, in terms of medical advice, but also there is so much snake oil and misinformation online. It's just a minefield and it can be quite controversial. So I don't want to get into the quagmire that is a lot of the so-called treatments for ME. I will talk about pacing because at the end of the day, pacing yourself is never gonna do you any harm. But anything else, no, I'm not talking about it, sorry. We'll do a few more questions regarding disability and then we'll move on to a happier topic, shall we? <laughs> so somebody asked whether I have found the, uh, the sewing community to be inclusive and somebody sort of responded to that comment and asked how it could be more inclusive. And that one really got me thinking because my automatic sort of reaction was, no, it is not inclusive. And then I felt that that was a little bit too simplistic an answer. I think as well, partly because my experience of the sewing community is quite different to other people's, I suppose. And I also think I've just been very good at curating my own online space <laughs> so that my online experiences generally in the sewing community have been quite positive. My experiences online in the historical costuming community or the historical so sewing community, that's another story. But on the flip side of that, some of the sewing events I've been to in person have been incredibly inaccessible but some of the historical costuming events I've been to have been great. They've been brilliant. You know, I've been to things in my wheelchair and it's in costume and it's been fine. When I think about the prior retire events I've been to, yeah, I don't know whether it was a considered approach, possibly, but there was always, you know, if because they were balls, there was always a space to sit down. There was a sort of quieter room you could go to if you needed a break. Um, when I went to Mogger Hanger, there was an accessible room that I could stay in the 1830s weekend. So my in-person experiences of historical costuming events have been great, but my online experiences have been terrible. I've also, I mean, I've had experiences at both ends of the sort of political spectrum. I've had the sort of, if you're in a wheelchair, you shouldn't wear a corset. What's the point of even trying? I've had those sort of kind of like ignorant people, like maybe costuming isn't for you if you're in a wheelchair then. I've had those sorts of experiences, but I've also had experiences at the other end of the spectrum where like, if I have tried to contribute anything to a discussion about equality and diversity as a disabled person, I just get ripped to shreds for like, I get my identity as a minority denied, I get told I'm too privileged to have an opinion, things like that. And I'm sort of like, I'm trying to, I'm trying to make things better for everybody here by including disabled people in discussions about inclusivity. <laughs> I don't know, at this point it's water off a duck's back to me. I've experienced quite a lot of discrimination in my life. And the benefit of online interactions is you can control them. You can just block people, you can unfollow people, you can leave forums. If they're not making space for you, don't, don't give them the gift of your presence, you know? <laughs> it's sort of how I feel about it. So how can the sewing community be more inclusive? I would love to see more really basic online inclusivity, like for goodness sake, caption your stories, caption your reels. It's so easy to do. You can get a free app that uses AI to do it for you. Just do it. Oh, it's, it frustrates me so much. Image description, uh, like image descriptions, video descriptions, that sort of thing. Um, I personally, and I think this is probably why I rubbed up so many people in discussions about inclusion the wrong way. I personally am not that bothered about 
uh, visual representation because disability is so diverse you know you cannot represent every person's disabled experience with a wheelchair user so just sticking somebody in a wheelchair in a photo shoot and that counting as inclusion is not good enough for me and also how do you represent somebody with a hidden disability visually you can't you just can't so I'm not that fussed about like sewing companies using disabled models or something what I am what I would rather see is the making easy read instructions making uh, projector files for their sewing making um, having the option to have a zero printing rather than having to tape a four bits of paper together those things to me say more about a brand's attitude to inclusivity than if they've got a woman in a wheelchair modeling their patent envelope do you know what i mean you know things like options where in the pdf you can um just choose the sizes that you want to print you have the layers that's one that you've got the layers so you can choose the sizes you want to print so you don't have to try and follow a dotted line when you're going cross-eyed because you've got dyslexia and the and the images are moving. Simple things like putting the measurements in both inches and centimetres, <laughs> you know, all these sorts of things. That to me would make the sewing community so much more inclusive than it currently is. So if you're watching this and you are a pattern company or you work for a pattern company or you have ambitions of being a sewing pattern designer, I'd like you to think about your disabled customers. How can you make this as easy as possible for people? Because the reality, at the end of the day, you don't have to be disabled to benefit from those things. Many of them are sort of personal preference. So you're just providing better customer experience generally. Okay, I think that's enough about disability. Shall we talk about knitting? So one of the other very common questions I got was, how did I learn to knit? How did I learn to sew? How did I learn to crochet? Or what got me into those things? So I sort of thought I'd talk through each of those before I kind of get onto the fun ones and hopefully end this video on a slightly more positive note. So let's start with knitting because that one's pretty easy. So my mum taught me to knit. My grandmother bought me a learn to knit kit one Christmas. I think I was six, six or seven. And my mum taught me how to knit. And I made a variety of very wonky um, garter stitch rectangles, which became scarves for teddy bears. <laughs> Tess7510 asked, do you still have the first garment you ever knit? And of course, can we see it? So no, <laughs> I do not still have the first garment I ever knit because it was a terrible wonky rectangle I made when I was six. So I'm afraid you can't see it. Um, you can, however, see my first ever vintage knitting project because that was, if it wasn't the Joan Crawford jumper, which I'll put a picture on the screen of, it's jacket uh, 487, the gray version with the embroidery, which you see me wear all the time. That was my first ever vintage knit. And somebody else asked, Ash, D-N-H-I-E, Ash Denise. 337 asked, what is one craft item you can't get rid of for the emotional value, not the physical value? And I still have those knitting needles from that learn to knit kit that my grandmother bought me. They're not very good needles, um, but she passed away shortly afterwards and I've kept them all this time. I think mostly by coincidence at first or by chance, but now um, I'm holding on to them deliberately because it's just amazing that I still have them after all these years and about 12 house moves. So, Oh, yes, that's knitting. Oh, I can't find I can't find any more number nines. I might have to move on to an, another colour. Can you see a number nine anywhere? Oh, I found I found some. I found some. I knit on and off throughout my childhood. I did a lot of knitting for charity. My mum's always done a lot of knitting, baby hats for preemies and blankets for the homeless and things like that. So I did a lot of that. But it's only really um, when I was doing my master's degree and I started freelancing in the costume industry that I got into knitting because um, I was working in a vintage shop at the time and a client came in and was talking about, she had ordered, I think from, I don't think she was called this at the time, but Betty Sparkles Vintage Knitwear on Instagram. Um, she'd ordered something from them and she was showing me the photos and how incredible it was. And I was thinking to myself, 
because I was freelancing. I could, I could, I know how to knit. I can make some vintage knits and sell them. That'll be a nice little uh, earner for me. Um, can't be that difficult, vintage knitting. I'll give it a go. So I went into a charity shop where I was living in North London and there happened to be a stack of some vintage knitting patterns. So I picked them up, I picked up some yarn and I gave it a go. And it turns out it was very difficult um, and I was quickly out of my depth. But I'd, but I, I haven't looked back since then. I sort of enjoy, I love a challenge, as you know. And I loved the challenge of trying to figure out these vintage patterns and finding the right yarn. And so I had to do all this research into knitting yarns and the history of knitting and things. And I, I was hooked and I've never looked back. So that would have been early 2018. So I moved back in with my parents shortly after that. But knitting has always been, for me, associated with ME because I, when I first got ME when I was 17, I was housebound for about six months and I had to drop out of college and I sort of was living quite a sad, lonely existence at home all day, every day, while my friends were out getting drunk and getting boyfriends and doing their exams and things like that. And I felt very much stuck in my life in the little village where I grew up and my mum suggested I do some knitting for charity and that might help me and I did and um, guess what she was right and I quite enjoyed it and I wanted to make her a um a, I think it must have been Mother's Day present and I couldn't leave the house to get her anything so I ordered off Amazon a learn to knit sock kit thinking well socks seem easy <laughs> you'll spot a theme here um and I taught myself how to knit socks Despite the fact I couldn't read at the time, I, don't, I must have used, just used the pictures in the book. Um, I learned how to knit socks and I knit my mum a pair of socks and I got absolutely hooked on sock knitting. And that was sort of the start of me falling in love with knitting. Whilst I'd done it since childhood, I, was, I, I just loved socks and it became a real source of fulfilment and joy for me as... I was housebound and in that very difficult period of my life. So I have some photographs of the, some of the socks I knit um, because we're in the Facebook era here. So I've got a couple still of those <laughs> that I put on Facebook because I was so proud of them, um, which I can show you. I don't have any of them because I gave them all away. I was making them for friends mostly at the time. But that's, that's what made me love knitting and really see it as a part of my identity perhaps because it is so linked with my identity as a disabled person, I don't know. But that's also when I learned to crochet. So I am a completely self-taught crocheter, um, whereas my mum taught me how to knit. My mum cannot crochet. <laughs> so I was going to say I taught myself using YouTube videos, but I don't think I did. I think I taught myself using a book. I don't know why I didn't use a video. Maybe because I had a book. And I made myself, I made various little things um, as gifts. I think I made a couple of amigurumis, but I never, I didn't really enjoy it at that time. I think it's just because I wasn't very good. But I did make um, a, a blanket for my bed when I went to university. Um, a chevron blanket from scraps of yarn. And I do have a photograph of that so I can show you my first sort of successful crochet project. I don't still have it because I donated it to one of the many refugee appeals that um, have since happened. Um, in this modern era that we're living through, um, I think we had, I think it must have been Syrian refugees at that time, but I did make myself another one. And you will have seen the sort of second version in a couple of videos. There's a theme. The only thing I really enjoy crocheting, it turns out, is chevron blankets. <laughs> Whereas I like complicated knitting projects, I like very straightforward crochet projects. In terms of sewing, I am probably one of the very few people of my generation who can honestly say, I learned to sew at school. I learned to sew at primary school. I learned to sew at secondary school. I was lucky enough, and luck comes into it a lot, to do GCSE textiles. I had no interest in learning how to sew, but I happened to have a falling out with a friend the week that we had to sign up to do our which subjects we were doing for our exams. So then we call that choosing your options. Um, for GCSE here in Britain. So at 14, you narrowed down the subjects you study at high school. I think I'd, I, uh, most people sort of do nine or 10. I ended up doing 11. Yeah, and I had been signed up to do food tech, but then I got in a fight with my friend because she was being racist. And she reported me to the head teacher <laughs> and I got in quite a lot of trouble and we weren't allowed to be in any 
classes together after that. So I had to change from food tech, which I was signed up to do to textiles. So complete coincidence. I didn't really want to do textiles. I just didn't want to be in any lessons with this girl after this horrible thing she'd said to me. So yeah, me and several of my friends who also didn't want to be in the class with her switched to do textiles. And we mostly just talked about Twilight. (laughs) Um, Somebody asked me if I was team Edward or team Jacob. Jacob I was at the time team Edward because oh no team Jacob because I do think that he was just a psychopath really wasn't he and when it gets to the point that the author in Eclipse is deliberately having to make you hate the guy that is supposed to be the third wheel because all the fans prefer him to the weird creepy vampire um yeah justice for Jacob (laughs) But that's how I learned to sew. I was taught at school. I did GCSE. And then when I had to, when I went back to college after I um, dropped out, I experienced quite a lot of discrimination from my college. They didn't want to take me back as a disabled student um, because I couldn't do full days. So I wanted to go part time and they didn't want me to do that. Um, So I had to kick, well, I, my mum kicked up quite a big fuss and they did eventually take me. But quite a few of the subjects I'd been signed up to before wouldn't take me because um, of my difficulty reading and I didn't get, wouldn't get funding for a uh, teaching assistant. So the only subjects that would take me at the time were, or that I wanted to do that would take me at the time were textiles and film studies. So I did textiles and film studies <laughs> um, for my first year back at Sixth Form College. And, and I had very supportive textiles teachers. They had an open, studio policy in the art department so my textiles teachers even if they were teaching another lesson they would let me go and sit in the back of their lessons so sometimes I would go and do my work quietly but oftentimes I would just sit there and rest (laughs) Um, because college is such an overwhelming you know school if you've got any kind of like sensory issues it's just hell you know like just the sound I can hear it now the sound of those metal chairs on a lino floor ugh I think that's all the number nines I can see. So what colour should I do next? I sort of started with the darkest ones or tried to start with the darkest ones. I think I picked like the biggest ones and worked backwards. But I've since done, I think I've done 13, 12, 11, 10 and 9. So part of me kind of wants to do 8, but 8 is a very dark one. Hmm. What's 14? Oh, a light purple. Let's do 14 then. So then when I got to A-level, I didn't know if I'd be well enough to go to university, but I think I mentioned I grew up in a very small village and um, I didn't know whether I was well enough. I didn't know whether I wanted to go. I didn't know what subjects would even accept me. It was a bit of a like very strange time in my life. And eventually my mum said to me, just pick something and get out of here. Um, So that's what I did. And I picked costume. So Leaf2576 asked me, with how much musical theatre work you've done, would you consider yourself a theatre kid? Do you have any favourite shows or favourite costumed ones? So I was very much a theatre kid. So I had always performed and particularly at that sort of A-level, teenage level, like all my friends were from my theatre group. Um, The theatre group were very accepting of me being disabled and sort of made accommodations for me. But that's how I got involved in costume. I started to make, because I could sew, because I was doing A-level textiles, they um, asked me if I would sew some stuff for the shows. And I did, and I sort of helped backstage on a couple if I wasn't well enough to be in them. Or like I had other conflicting exams and things like that when the shows were on. I'd never really considered doing anything with theatre. I mean, because all my friends were theatre kids, A lot of them were going to drama school to try or were going to try and get into drama school to be an actor. And they were all sort of trying to convince me that I should do the same. And I was like, I really don't want to be an actor. That sounds like hell to me. And uh, but I did meet somebody who suggested to me that I do costume. And I was like, I don't know if I want to do costume. Oh, no, uh, I'm not sure. Um, But I went to a couple of university open days and I just absolutely fell in love with it. And I was like, okay, so that's what I did. I picked costume. And I got out of my small village and I went to university to study costume and it turned out I found my thing. It was just complete coincidence, as so often happens in life. Life puts you on a path that you could never imagine. And 
something happens at the end of it that is just, you know, I think that's the sort of thing about life really that I have learned is that you think you know where you're going and what you want to do in life and you don't. (laughs) And things happen and things change and you end up in places you never expected, but you can still be happy. You know, you think you know what will make you happy and you don't. Um, I never would have imagined that I would be costuming. I never would have imagined that I would do YouTube, but here we are. And I, I love it. So yes, I definitely consider myself a theatre kid. My favourite show, I, this, it's, ugh, it's very difficult. I am quite a traditionalist. I have very traditional musical tastes. And I think that is because I love vintage stuff. And so I love the vintage costumes. I love the vintage music. So I think my favourite would probably be Anything Goes. Yeah, Anything Goes. It's got everything you could want. I mean, it's also got, they have at least updated the casual racism at the end, but it's got tap dancing, it's got great costumes, it's got lovely songs, um, brilliant ensemble numbers, strong female lead. Yeah, Anything Goes, I think, would be my favourite. My favourite one I've ever costumed. So costuming a show is really weird working on a show is really weird because the show itself can be rubbish but the people make it so if you work with great people and you have a lovely time um those are some of my favorite shows i've worked on so i worked on i'm not saying that this is a rubbish show it's a great show but i worked on a new musical uh, for the national youth music theater called brass and it's about this is the first world war one show i worked on of many i've worked on many so it's called brass because it's about a brass band from yorkshire who sign up as what's called a pals battalion in world war one so the way they recruited soldiers in world war one they would quite often go into towns villages workplaces football clubs whatever and the entire group of young men would sign up and they would put them all in the same battalion. What, of course, that then meant was if that battalion was sent to the Somme, an entire village, the male population of an entire village or football team or train station or whatever it is, was was just decimated because nobody came home. And that is what happened with this particular about Pals Battalion in Leeds. They all died. So it's a sad show. But it's also, a lot of World War I shows are just about the soldiers, but this show is called Brass because it is also about the women they left behind who worked in the munitions factory making brass shells. So uh, it just had a really lovely duality to it. It was a lot of, because it was the youth theatre, because it was a youth theatre production, it was um, a lot of people my age, we had a lot of fun. Yeah, met some great people, had a nice time. So that was my favourite one I've costumed. And the story is so poignant. And we, we really tried to make it as sort of authentic as possible. So we made all the World War I munitions uniforms, which I w- we were really pre- pleased, pleased with, which I think we did a really good job. You know, it was all those little details, like they had to wear an ID tag in case there was an explosion um, and they couldn't be identified. Things like that, you know, um, we really tried to do those, because it's based on a true story, we really tried to do these real people justice. Um, so it was incredibly moving to be a part of and I always look back on that time fondly so that's my favourite one I've costumed a lot of people asked um, what's my favourite thing I've ever made what's my dream project things like that so I'll do a little bit of a rapid fire my dream project is probably to make um, it's probably something historical so it's probably to make something along the theme of my master's degree thesis which somebody else asked me about, I wrote my master's degree thesis on the aesthetic dress movement, trying to establish the origins of the aesthetic dress movement. So I would like, my dream project would be to make a Liberty style gown. I have the fabric, I bought the thread, I just haven't been able to get started on it. Maybe one day, but I've got a little bit of like perfectionist self-sabotage going on in that I can't get started because I want it to be perfect. But maybe one day I'll get over that and I'll give it a go. My favorite thing I've ever made It's probably my half scales. So I did this half scale project um, when I was at university. So my costuming degree was primarily sewing, but also theater skills, because I went to a drama school. So um, we did this project in our second year where we had to make a half scale version of something from one of Janet Arnold's books. 
and they're just so cute and I really enjoyed the research of it. I went to see the original dress in Salisbury. My photographs are now in the new edition of Janet Arnold so I can sort of show you a picture of that. And it was just a really fun project. I learned about historical hand sewing techniques. Oh, I've missed a bit on one here. And I enjoyed it so much, I've since made some more. And I really recommend, if you want to try historical costuming, but you don't want to make full scale ball gowns because of either firstly the cost or fit issues or energy limitations or disability issues or whatever, um, make a half scale version. You can get half scale mannequins so you can always sort of display them if you like or you can just have the clothes sort of be really cute and small. So yes I'd say that's my favourite project I've made is the half scales project. Let's put the paintbrush down and I'll get the iPad and we'll read a few. Do you have any tips for knitting Fair Isle? I really admire your Yale cardigan. So swatch 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 would be my first tip. I would also say don't start with the L cardigan because it's it's a long slog. So make smaller things first, maybe make a toile of, you know, in the style of like a mock-up or a toile, less expensive yarn, smaller quantities of yarn, not so worried about the fit, something like a hat or gloves or even a scarf in a tube. Um, and I would also say choose the right yarn because it is much easier to knit Fair Isle with real Shetland yarn because it's grippiness and also try different knitting styles. So you might find it really difficult to manage two yarns if you use a throwing style, but if you could try and learn a picking style, you might find it easier to keep the tension even. So Morris and Hannah asked if, do I live with family? I covered that one. And what's your knitting or sewing ick? Well, I can tell you my crochet ick is granny squares. I don't understand why people think they look good. I really don't. My knitting ick, circular yoke sweaters. They don't look good on me and I don't understand why people rave about them. I don't think they look good on a lot of people, <laughs> but I guess they're fun to knit. So people keep making them. And my sewing ick, for sewing, it's got to be people not pressing their seams. Like so much of good sewing, of getting an elevated finish is good pressing. To the extent that in, in garment factories, people that do the pressing get paid more than doing the sewing. <laughs> so <laughs> press your seams. That's unpressed seams. That's my sewing ick. Yvonne Knits has asked me what's the most vintage pattern I've ever knit. That would be something 1840s for the ball. Probably the shawl was from the earliest book. Matron asked, tell us a funny story from your childhood. Um, so when I was six, my, I got a letter from Mickey Mouse inviting me to go to Disneyland Paris for my sixth birthday. And I went, I had a great time. And I even took the letter from Mickey Mouse into show and tell at school because I was so proud of it and everyone was jealous of me. And I found it about five years later and it was written in my mum's handwriting and I cried because I was so devastated. <laughs> the magic, the magic of Disney was ruined for me. With hindsight, I realised it was a really sweet thing for my mum to do, but yeah, that's sort of typical of me. I was like, you lied to me. <laughs> a lot of people ask me how I get commissions um, for, for professional costuming stuff. And I'm afraid to tell you, people ring me. I, I, don't, I don't do anything. People I know in the industry know that I freelance and they t send me a message and they say, what's your availability like? Are you taking work? Have you got space for a commission? And I have not said yes for a very long time because I've been too ill. Uh, but yeah, basically I'd be like, yeah, sure. And they would either post me all the bits and I'd make it in my garage or I'd go into whatever workroom they were working in um, in the days when I could travel and help them out. So it's who you know, I'm afraid, unfortunately, as is often the case with a lot of these industries. Any funny story or anecdote from your time as a student? That's from Meow D. Um, I had an actor turn up to a costume fitting not wearing any underwear <laughs> and like you're like oh hi please try these trousers on that I've ordered from you know an online shop and I need you to and I need to fit on you and they're like yeah I don't have any underwear on and you're just stood there like okay so we had a stash of sort of like costume underwear in our costume store at university so I had to go down to the costume store and find like a used pair of pants and bring up for this guy to put on. And I had to be like, what size do you need? It was like more absolutely mortifying, absolutely mortifying as an experience. So that's quite a funny story from my time <laughs> as a student. A couple of people, so Mare from Strinchronicity, as was Mare. Mare, I would say this, Cole Cloth. 
but um, I appreciate that's my British pronunciation probably coming through there. You've mentioned working on film productions, any we'd be familiar with. So that's an interesting one because often film productions, you don't really know what you're working on or that's my experience of it anyway, as a sort of um, freelance person going into workrooms for a day. So quite often I would get, I would either see an advert on Facebook, that's the other way I get commissions. I'm in a couple of like Facebook networking groups for costumers. So I'd see an advert on Facebook, you know, oh, I need people to come into my workroom in East London for a week or for a day to sew on buttons. And I'd be like, and they'd sort of state the pay and I'd be like, I can sew on buttons for that much for a day. So I'd go and I'd sort of turn up and they'd be like, yeah, these are for uh, Dumbo, <laughs> for Tim Burton's Dumbo with Disney. And I'd be like, oh, okay, cool. But sometimes they wouldn't tell you. So you'd just turn up and sew things, hem skirts or whatever. Because I think as well, one of the things I should make clear is that like, I was, I was doing my professional sewing work sort of between the age of 21 and 25 as a new graduate and an apprentice. So they weren't giving me important things to work on. So um, like I hemmed some skirts for, is it Alice in Wonderland or Alice Through the Looking Glass? One of those. They were four background actors. They probably were not in shot. The trousers I sewed on buttons for Dumbo probably might have been cut from the film. I don't know, I haven't seen it. So um, it's, a, it's a weird experience sewing for film and I don't think the general public really appreciate how films are made. But yeah, you can work on something. I know somebody who hand quilted a doublet um, for Stone White and the Huntsman, I think. And uh, it had like one second of screen time. It literally like went across the screen like that and that was it. And they'd spent months hand quilting it. And that's what it's like working in film. I had a little break because the camera needed to charge, but that's good. That's good pacing. We like that. Some people asked, I had a couple of people ask about, have I made anything for famous people? Or who's the most famous person I've worked with? Things like that. So um, see my previous point about the fact that I've always had quite junior roles. They don't trust me with the celebrities. <laughs> so um, I haven't really made anything for anybody particularly famous. And because I mostly did my making work for theatre, a lot of the people who I have made things for are theatre famous people. So you probably, if you're not interested in British West End um, culture, I suppose you will never have heard of them. But I suppose the biggest name, if you like, that I can drop, um, I did work, I volunteered for a charity concert for the Mad Trust called West End Bears. And I believe there's a Broadway version as well. And this big event, West End Bears, is a Chippendales style stripper show, I suppose. Um, it's kind of burlesque, it's very camp, it's very gay, it's very theatrical. And this particular one that I worked on was hosted by Graham Norton. Now, the act that I was working for was the opening act. And I think he just did like a brief introduction to the show. Um, but I met him in the wings. It was a very narrow wing. And so we had to do a sort of awkward, I had to readjust the cam camera to show you. We had to do a sort of awkward past each other in the wings. <laughs> and it was one of those things where I was sort of smiling like, oh, this is awkward. Halfway through, I realized it was Graham Norton and I was like, <laughs> Actual spinster asked, if your life was a color, what color would it be? I think I'd say brown because brown, I feel is underappreciated and it's not that I think that I'm underappreciated. God, that makes me sound cocky. No, I just mean my life has been very unusual and there are people out there who would not value my kind of life, but I think it's beautiful. Cold Light One asked, what is your favourite colour to work with? Is it one you like wearing? For example, I love using bright colours but don't like wearing them. Yeah, I was thinking about this. I like working with blue, but I don't like wearing a lot of blue. She says wearing blue today. <laughs> and I, I do like that blue dress I made, so maybe that's not. <laughs> I do also quite like working in white. I know it's a pain, but I do like particularly the texture you can get, the detailed texture you can get from white work, but white doesn't suit me, so I don't like wearing it. Any advice for another stash busting knitter with a 30 to 40 year old stash about how to find projects to use up lots of yarn? This is from Alison Little Fortin, 4891. 
So my advice would be look for patterns based on meterage requirements or yardage requirements. So Ravelry can be very useful for that. I know Ravelry is not the most accessible and it can be quite annoying to navigate because it's so old fashioned now. But if you if you don't know the meterage of the yarns you have, you can make an estimate by weighing them. And if you know the weight, if you don't know the weight, you can figure it out using wraps per inch. So I would say try and find patterns based on meterage. And if you can't find a pattern, so you know if you've got 150, if you know you've got 150 meters approximately of a yarn, you can put that in either in the hat category, because that's basically all you're going to get out of 150 meters, or then look what other yarns you have that it will work with to make another garment and sort of add up the meterage and go, okay, so if I combine that 150 meters with that one that I've got 300 meters of, I might be able to make a scarf, a shawl, something like that, you know? That's my advice. Have you ever worked with hand spun yarn or would you like to try it? I have tried spinning with a drop spindle and I can show you some of my very poor efforts of hand spun yarn. Um, I would love to learn it. That's something else somebody else asked. Oh, hang on, who was this question from? Fairly fiber fun. Oh, you asked two questions. If you could custom create the perfect yarn, what would be its characteristics? For me, the perfect yarn is probably a vintage three ply. If you could recreate patterns beehive fingering three ply, that's my perfect yarn. <laughs> but also I have tried spinning. I would like to do more spinning. I just am not sure. I might have to get an e-spinner. I think that's what we'll have to do. I need to do more research on spinning. What style have you not made yet, but always wanted to from Bernard Many or Manny? I'd love to do something bustle era, maybe first bustle era. Something impressionist would be nice. Um, it's just one of those things, I know I'm never gonna wear that sort of gown, so unless I get to work on that kind of show, which I might, and it's just lined up that I never have, I would like to make one. When you're knitting or sewing, do you craft in silence or do you like to listen to watch things? This is from Little Prairie Library. I craft in silence, I have noise sensitivity issues, and I previously used to listen to audiobooks, but since I got COVID, I really struggle to focus uh, on the plot of anything, including films and TV series. So um, it's kind of ruined my enjoyment of TV and film, but also audiobooks. So on a similar note, Lisa Lot, 5452, asked, what's your favorite fiction book and non-fiction book? As a librarian, I obviously have to ask. So I lost the ability to read when I first got Emmy and I had to teach myself how to read again, which was an interesting experience at 17. But after that, I got really into books. And so not being able to read has been a big loss for me. Um, but I also realized I discovered audiobooks. They just became so much more accessible with the internet. So I've read a lot of things that I never would have been able to physically read a hard copy book off because of my dyslexia. So my favorite fiction book is really difficult to pick. The other thing is that because of my ME, I have memory issues. So I genuinely cannot remember a lot of my past, my childhood. And one of the things in particular, I often read the same book, not realizing I've read it twice because my reading, particularly if I read the hard copy book, because my information processing and storing of written, inf written information is so bad. So there will probably be books I haven't thought about or cannot think about in this moment. But I, my, sort of my go-to answer if people ask me what my favourite book is, it's probably something Thomas Hardy. Let's pick one. Return of the Native, I think, would probably be my favourite. Um, in terms of non-fiction books, I recently read, or I remember it recently, uh, a book called Nella Last's War, which is the um, mass observation diaries of a woman called Nella Last. Yeah, L-A-S-T, Last, Last. And she wrote these extensive diaries about her experience as a housewife in World War II. And it was adapted into a TV series starring Victoria Wood called Housewife 49. It's just fascinating to me. And particularly given that that is such an era area of interest for me, the 1940s and sort of women's domestic labour in the 1940s. It was just a fascinating read, incredibly moving. And I think this kind of leads me on to another question somebody asked me about. So Julia Callan 94 asked, I love hearing you talk about and think about the process and decisions when making things, especially 1940s. What about this era makes it so special to you and what is more fun, planning, doing or the end result of a project? Oh, okay. So let's talk about the first section of that. I love hearing you talk about 
talk and think about the process and decision when making things, especially 1940s. What about this era makes it so special to you? I'm going to show you some more painting because I might be talking about this for a while. Well, first of all, I like the style of the clothes and the style of the clothes suits me. And that is a big part of it. <laughs> but also, I'm half British, half German. And so when you are, I think, any bit German, there always comes a sort of cultural responsibility surrounding the Holocaust and World War II. So I've always tried to stay as informed, as educated as possible. And I am always gobsmacked by the ignorance of British people around World War II. And I'm particularly appalled by the sort of flat out Holocaust denial I frequently see from Americans online, even within the historical costuming community, which to me is inexcusable. So it's always sort of been there in the background of my life, particularly because, you know, my grandparents lived through it. There's always been people around me talking about in the war, and it's always sort of been this spectre in the background, if you like. But really, I think what appeals to me about it is I'm always drawn to stories where people overcome adversity. And obviously adversity, when we're talking about World War II, is a sliding scale. But I, am, I, I suppose because of my own situation, I'm particularly interested in instances of adversity in Britain because Britain was so much more, so much further removed from the day-to-day -day of World War II that for a long period, they lived with only really very mild inconveniences um, to the extent that they called it the phony war for the first six or eight months of it. But those day-to-day -day minor inconveniences, over a period of time, they do add up and you really start to see the effect that it had on people. And so I'm just curious how people coped, how they dealt with it. And I think that's because I live with a lot of day-to-day -day conveniences and there are often times where I don't know how I'm going to cope. And so I find reading their stories or find looking at how resourceful they were and I find a lot of comfort in that. I don't really know. It, I find it reassuring to read their stories and I find it helps me feel connected to the past, to my own history, and it keeps me vigilant in terms of not letting it happen again, which I think we need a little bit more of in today's world because fascism is on the rise everywhere. If you could go back in time to the Claude who was just starting out in crafting, what advice would you give her? Was asked by Sue Lee 8747. Well, I would say stop talking about Twilight in textiles class and get some work done. <laughs> that would help. I need a new color. What did I do? 14? Should we do 15? What colour is 15? Oh no, white. That's not good. Let's pick one at random. 17. Um, I would say don't be afraid to try new things. <laughs> Can't bloody well open these pots. Ah, there we go. I would say don't be afraid to try new things. I would say um, you are more creative than you realise just because you like maths and science doesn't mean you're not an artist. And I would say, try not to be such a perfectionist and don't be so anxious, don't be so anxious to create stuff. Pattern Treasures asks, thinking along the lines of the daisy maker, are there any other vintage antique tools or gadgets you'd love to try? I'd love to try a circular sock machine. I'm hoping I might be able to get a 3D printed one, but it's a work in progress, so we shall see. I'd also love to try a smocking pleater to make a Liberty's aesthetic dress. And I'd love to try one of those sort of like fluting iron things, you know, crimping irons. They look fun. Little Glowfly42 asked, who's the German Tante you're mentioning sometimes? Can you tell us more about her and your relationship? So yeah, that's my Tante Ingrid. I never met her. <laughs> she was my great uncle's wife. They couldn't have children. And when she passed away, my aunt, my biological aunt, inherited a lot of her stuff. And she got in contact with me and she knew I did crafting and knitting stuff and said, do you want all this stuff that was Ingrid's? And I was like, yeah, okay. So she drove to England and she brought it to me. And I'm so glad she did because I use it all so regularly, as you hear me say. I also inherited several excellent pairs of German shears, uh, which are uh, too heavy for me to use. <laughs> Um, but I also inherited things like her homemade pincushion and it's just really sweet that I've got that and it'll go to somebody in the family who will appreciate and remember Ingrid. 
What craft would you like to try out someday? That's from Ash Dennehy, 337. Gold work. I'd love to try gold work embroidery. Sarah Carstairs. Sarah Carstairs? Yeah. 8141 asked, what's the weirdest thing you've ever made or been asked to make? And then asks, if you could snap your fingers and become a master of a particular crafting skill, what skill would it be? So the skill I'd, I would pick would probably be, I don't know whether you would count these as crafting, but it would be language or music. If I could learn any skill, it would be language or music. Because of my cognitive abilities, they've both gone. I cannot remember new words. I cannot learn music in the way that I once could because I do play the piano and I sing. So um, I would like to be able, I would love to be able to do that, but it's not possible with my disability. In terms of uh, what's the weirdest thing I've ever been asked to make, it's probably a prop <laughs> because that is categorically not my department. I had quite a few questions about getting into costume. Um, 22 ETU asked, what were some of the biggest challenges of getting into your industry slash line of work? And a lot of that is to do with, I'm going to say it, class and geographical location. I, it's so much to do with who you know. And obviously, theatre people and film people, they tend to be quite privileged or from quite privileged backgrounds. If you have ever Googled um, any sort of British Hollywood actor, particularly the male ones, they probably went to public school. And yes, they're very talented actors, but there are lots of very talented actors out there. And the reason why Benedict Cumberbatch and Tom Hiddleston are famous has got nothing to do with their talent and everything to do with their upbringing. And like I say, geographical location, I am lucky that I live within sort of reasonable commuting distance to London. A lot of people who do not, do not get the same sort of theatre opportunities that I have had because the theatre industry is so focused in London. Similarly, I have not had the same film opportunities that some people have had because, because I cannot access a lot of the film studios because you have to drive to them and I cannot drive more than about five miles. I've seen, I've picked this colour. And so far, I've only seen two little sections with this number. <laughs> Is that it, really? I mean, it might be. Oh, somebody with a user and then a load of uh, letters, username, asks, where do you find vintage knitting patterns? They usually find me. I usually find them in charity shops. Sometimes I get them off eBay. I've, it's at the point now where people are constantly offering to send them to me. So I will say, please don't offer to send me vintage knitting patterns. It's, it's, I get inundated with requests. I get so many messages on Instagram, Kofi, all sorts of things. I do not have the space. I do not have the space. And I will hoard them under my bed. And I know people want them to go to a good home and they want them to be used and appreciated. But I have more than I will ever make in a lifetime at this point. So if you do have some and you're looking to get rid of them, I do recommend putting them on eBay because Somebody might want them. We're going to do number two next. So finally, I can't find who asked this now, but I think to finish, um, I got a couple of questions that were sort of like, how are you doing? Uh, how's the new posting style working out for you? I hope you're, a are you able to sew yet um, with my neck? So no, I'm not really able to sew yet. I did try recently. <laughs> I did try recently <sighs> for the first time um, in a little while and um, it went quite well at the time and then I sat down on the sofa afterwards and instantly got a migraine. So that's frustrating. So I a lot of the pl things that I had hoped to do in my Claude Makes New Things, no, in my a sort of update series that I did at the start of the year, I, I'm still not there yet. I am still going to physio, but it's just so slow progress when you have ME and you can't really exercise and you have to keep pacing. I also have had to cancel a couple of physio, I've had to cancel my most recent physio appointment because I overdid it and ended up in a crash. So I'm doing okay. I've got other things to fill my life. I'm Obviously I'm having to make things, I'm making this costume for the theatre group, even though I can't really sew. But that's mo going to be mostly altering things. And I'm hoping if I do enough careful pacing, I will be able to manage it. So I'm hoping that might be a little bit of a test to see what I can actually manage. It's just very frustrating. But the new posting style seems to be doing really well. I mean, I've got my numbers have gone up considerably, but I do think that is largely to do with the shorts. So if you've come 
typically people who watch short videos on YouTube do not then come to your long form videos. So if you are one of those people who found me through shorts and you've watched my long videos and you're sort of here now and you're on the retro Claude hype train, please leave me a comment and let me know that it worked um, and that you are sort of the exception that proves the rule. <laughs> but I do like making the shorts. The only thing is they are, they are not profitable. So I sort of figured out that like I make about roughly two pound if I post a short. So if I'm sort of want to make like an hourly wage, I have to make about 10 an hour. <laughs> um, or even to like, like, to like to make minimum wage even, I need to make six shorts an hour, which is not realistic, is it? So, I mean, I'm gonna keep doing them because I enjoy them and they're fun for me. And they are manageable for me on days when long videos are not. But it's, like I say, it's not a get rich quick scheme. It's a scheme to try and keep interest in my channel ticking over. I also repurpose all my shorts on Instagram as reels. So if you are following my reels on Instagram, but not watching shorts on YouTube, they're the same thing and the shorts go up first. So if you wanna see my reels before everybody else, you should subscribe to YouTube, you should watch them on YouTube. And I do that deliberately because while I get paid a pittance for them on YouTube, I do get paid for them and you don't on Instagram. You know, I make no money from posting them on Instagram. And I mean, that's fine, but uh, it is nice to know that at least YouTube is giving me a share of the revenue they're making from the adverts they run on my content, not unlike unlike Instagram who keep all of it. They're gonna make you sit through adverts to watch my videos. The least they could do is share it with creators, in my humble opinion. But the compilation videos were a stroke of genius. I get so many comments from people telling me they found me from my six hour stash busting video. So if you're one of those people, hi, thanks for joining us. Um, I'm sorry I then took a break from stash busting and sort of left you desperately wanting more. Um, but yeah, that one's been, that like some of them have done really well. The knitting ones have done really well. The sewing ones have not done very well sort of historical costuming ones that's fine I know that my the people that watch my channel do not are not that interested in historical costuming the sort of, that's sort of the way it's gone channel audiences are always growing and evolving um, but also I do find it quite interesting that the historical costuming community generally which we know is pretty healthy online for whatever reason do not find my videos or do not want to watch my videos and given my experiences of ableism in the historical costuming community, I wonder why. It also could be because I'm British and my sort of interests don't line up with American, <clears throat> American history. I'm not, you know, I'm not making 1770s gowns. Oh, don't tell me I just smudged that. <sighs> I did. Oh, well. It's been nice for me to have a sort of little break from creating and take some time away from making things and speaking to camera because I really was going through a period where I couldn't, I just couldn't face talking to you. But it's been lovely to still be able to read your comments and reply to your comments and sort of feel connected to you that way, even though I didn't feel like I had the strength to film myself. So to see the community grow based on work I've already done, particularly because sometimes you put out a video and you think, this was a really good video, why didn't anybody see it? And then you kind of update the thumbnail and put it in a compilation and suddenly you're getting loads of comments about, oh, this was great. And you're like, yeah, I know it was great. <laughs> I'm sorry I was bad at thumbnails <laughs> and titles and playing this sort of YouTube game. Yeah, it's been, it's been very um, fulfilling to sort of be like, oh, yeah, I, I, I've done it, I've done, I, done, I did good, I did a good thing. Um, in terms of what's coming next, I really don't know. <laughs> I've got a couple of Claude Tries New Things. I've got my first sort of PR package I've ever received from like a sort of independent crafting company. So I'd like to try that one for a video. I'm really enjoying making slightly, I think part of the th reason why I've been struggling with making sewing videos is for the past basically two years since I got COVID, all the sort of new content I filmed has been stash busting content. Anything else that I put out, I sort of pre-filmed the sewing. I just prefer to make these more casual chatty videos now. And I think that's because I'm struggling so much with reading and writing. Previously, I would write a voiceover script and sort of, and read it out, or I would script a video and talk about something. And I just can't do that anymore. So the sort of videos I'm having to make have had to be more vlog style. 
and a lot of my planned, I had some plans to make sort of like tutorials and sort of like video essays, but realistically, I just don't have the brain power to write a video essay. So I don't think those are gonna work for me. So maybe going forward, you'll get a couple more of these slightly more informal chatty videos. God, this section is massive. I've gotten really in the zone and I forgot I was filming. <laughs> so thank you very much for your questions. I, I apologize, this is an incredibly long video. I hope you've sort of been able to do some crafting and hang out with me for a little bit. I don't know what the upload schedule is going to be like. So I've been trying this new thing where at the end of the video, I recommend one that you might like because if it's, it really helps me if you click on the, um, the next video in the, in the little cards here. Sends YouTube a little algorithmic message that you want to stay on my channel and keep watching my content. So uh, they recommend that you kind of are like, oh, if you, oh, do you have issues with sewing? Well then, if you, you should try, well, did you like my duck video? Then make sure you check out this six hour stash busting compilation. You know, I've been doing a little bit of that because that's what they recommend you do to get people to click. Um, but I don't know what to recommend to you. Shall I pick one at random? Oh, I mustn't get in the zone. So, um, why don't you watch this video about the crochet dress I made from the 1960s? And I had to make a slip to go underneath it because it was see-through. And a lot of people in the comments were telling me about, oh, it's meant to be see-through. I know, that's why I made a slip. I know. Watch that video, read the comments, let me know what you think. <laughs> Thanks for watching. See you next time.